Hello, I'm Jay Smith, Senior Pastor at State Street United Methodist Church. I'm so pleased that you're joining us for this service of worship. If you do not have a church home, I want to invite you to join us in person each Sunday morning at 8.08 and 10 a.m. We're located at the corner of State and 11th Streets in Bowling Green. And you can also find us on our website at www.statestreetumc.org. And now may you be blessed by this service of worship. Uh, there are Get Connected cards on the pews all around you. We'd love to reconnect about the ministries of our church. You can bring that card to me at the double doors at the back after the service or to my left, your right, these double doors. A member of our hospitality team would love to greet you after the service. They actually have a gift for you and some information that we hope would be helpful to you. So just keep that in mind if you're a guest visiting today. I'm glad all of you are here, but I know that uh, we're very blessed and fortunate to have with us our new district superintendent and his family are with us today. And in good Methodist fashion, they're on the back pew, which is a one. I don't know how they secured that. You got to get here pretty early to get the back pew, but they're there. Mark, would you stand up? Mark Dickinson and his wife, Jennifer. And Rebecca and Abby are back there. Rebecca is at Greenwood High. Watch the paper for soccer highlights. You'll be seeing her name, no doubt. And Abby is at Drake's Creek. They also have a daughter, Melanie, who's at the University of Louisville. Mark, welcome. We're glad that you're here today. Just a few things just to be aware of. This coming, uh, well, before this coming Wednesday night, be aware of the ministry architect's information in the bulletin there for you. There are some times that you can come and give us feedback. What we're doing is we're developing our strategic plan, our ministry plan, and we're looking at all the different ministries and programs in the church. And we want to hear from you. We want you to be a part of this. So please come, call the church office, sign up for one of those times, and uh, it'll be a good experience for all of us to get your feedback. So keep that in mind. This coming Wednesday is Wednesday night gathering begins again. Marty's going to have a great meal for us this Wednesday, and this Wednesday we're going to hear from some of our youth and some of our young adults who were on mission trips uh, this past summer. And so I don't know if you went on a mission trip when you were a young person, but it's really important that we encourage and support them, and so I hope you'll come out to hear their presentations uh, this Wednesday night. Speaking of youth and young adults, Jamie Unland is our minister for those areas, and she has a special announcement for you at this time. Okay, quick announcement. Youth starts next Sunday night. There is a parent meeting today following this service in the youth room. Um, everyone that has a child or a student, sixth grade to 12th grade is invited. Mark, you guys can come. I did not know that you would be here, but your children are also welcome. I like our youth group, it's pretty good. So if you're looking for a youth group, Come to the meeting following the service. I'll give you the entire semester's schedule. Plus, we have an exciting change that is coming our way. Um, and if you want to know about that, if you are a parent, you need to come to the meeting. And I will tell you all about that after this service. That is called a tease right there. That's a tease. I don't know how you got here today. I'm not sure what brought you to this place, but I'm so glad you've come. We're all here for the same reason. And that's to worship God. Let us worship the Lord.
call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 95, and it may be found in your red hymnal on page 814. I invite you to turn there and stand as we call upon the Lord this morning. Page 814. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. For the Lord is a great God and a great ruler above all gods, in whose hands are the depths of the earth and also the heights of the mountains. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is our God. We are the people of God's pasture, the sheep of God's hand. And as we remain standing, let us join in singing number 121, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Remain standing as you're able. Our affirmation of faith this morning is printed in your bulletin. Let us join our voices in this historic affirmation, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The first reading is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. It can be found on your, in your pew Bible on page 74 and in the large print version on page 118. <clears throat> Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And 
on it, you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For six, in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we prepare our hearts for prayer this morning, I invite you to join in singing number 186 in your red hymnal, Alleluia. Awesome God, your ways are higher than ours. Your wisdom is beyond our imagining and your grace beyond our deserving. We come to worship you this morning, recognizing that you alone are worthy of praise just because of who you are, God. We want to honor you in ways that please you we try to do that in ways that are our own, ways that seem right to us, but we know we often fall short. We want to do your will, but sometimes we struggle to understand what that is. We want to be obedient, but sometimes it seems that what you're asking is just too hard. But you know our hearts, God. You know our desire is to follow you, and so you send your spirit to help us to do that, especially when the way seems hard and the obstacles insurmountable. Lord, we pray today, especially for those whose journey includes hardship and heartache this day. We pray for those who've chosen the wrong path and are wandering away from you. Help each of us to reject those things and those attitudes which pull us away from your will. Grant each of us your strength and your wisdom to recognize those for what they are when they come our way. Grant us your guidance and your peace. We thank you for your word which has so much to teach us. We thank you for your son who has given so much to save us. And we thank you for your spirit, who does so much to help us each and every day. Help us to be open to your presence and your leading so that we might respond to the opportunities you place before us to do good, whatever the time or the place, for whoever might need it, not based on some criteria of our own choosing, but based on your boundless love and grace and mercy for us all. We ask all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus, and we pray together now the prayer he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> it's our opportunity each and every day to give back to God as cheerful givers. I want to mention a few opportunities that we have in front of us this week. One, outside the church office, there is a display with a backpack on a table which is full of food. It's an example of what the backpack ministry gives to each child each week who's a part of that program so that they can eat over the weekends when they're not in school. And I want to celebrate with you last week's Joyful Noise offering. Brought in $602 and some cents of change that you all contributed to that backpack ministry. And that will feed five children for an entire year. So thank you for your generosity. If you'd like to contribute further, there are uh, sign-up sheets on that table near that backpack, and you can see all the ways that you might contribute further to that ministry. I also want to mention our move-in day tomorrow to help Western students get into the dorms from 4 to 8 p.m., We'll have a group of State Street folks on campus to help with that effort. If you can help with that, you can sign up outside the church office, or you can see Jamie Unlin, who you saw just a few moments ago, to sign up and help with that. And next Sunday, I'm told that we are invited to wear red, and I thought it was because I was going to Arkansas and that would be Razorback Red, <laughs> but apparently not. So whatever, whichever team you root for, uh, we are invited to wear red next Sunday as we do celebrate uh, the presence of Western in our community and those students and all that they mean to the life of this church and this town. So with all of those announcements and opportunities before us, I invite our ushers to come forward to receive God's tithes and our offerings.
Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you bearing these gifts and tithes, knowing that you are, are our creator and the source of all good things. You have showered us with greatness and love. Look upon, look into our hearts and see the gratitude for your unconditional love. You are our rock and our spirit, and without you, we are nothing. So, Father, as your humble spirits, accept these tithes and gifts. Use them to reflect your glory in this community and throughout the world. Guide us to use the funds wisely to help the hungry, the sick, the homeless, the children, the elderly, the displaced, and to spread your message of universal love and peace. We pray all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, kids, would you guys join me down front for some time together? Come on in. Come on down. I'm so happy to see you all this morning. <clears throat> all right. The first thing we have to know for today, for today's question, is if we know the days of the week. Anybody learned that yet in school? Yeah, we got some who know the days of the week. All right. <clears throat> what are they? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Okay, so this is a multiple choice question. Okay, I'm going to tell you an activity and you tell me what day or days of the week are a good day to do them. All right? So what days are the best days to go to school? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Unless you're sick. Unless you're sick. Okay, <laughs> that's very good. All right. Let's see, um, what days are good days to eat ice cream? Um, I like ice cream when I eat all of my food. Anytime you've eaten all your food, cleaned your plate. All right, what's a, oh, you have an ice cream one, okay. On Sunday. Because ice cream Sundays, uh-huh, okay. You got another ice cream one? Okay. On Friday. Okay, why Friday? Okay, just any day's a good day to have ice cream, right? All right, what's a good day to take a nap? Is there a good day to take a nap, Emery? Saturday's a good day to take a nap. Anybody else who hasn't answered yet have a good day to take a nap, Owen? Sunday after church, after church. All right. Um, let's see. What's a good day to come to church? Daniela? Sunday. Sunday's a good day. Did you know we're going to be here on Wednesday night this week, too? Yay! That's another good day to come to church. Yay. Okay. All right. Let's see. What's a good day to tell a lie? Helen? Not any day. Not any day. Whew. Okay. Okay. No. Oh, April Fool's Day. That was it. Yeah. Okay. All right. What's a good day to do something nice for somebody else? Lily? Every day. Every day. That's right. There's a, there's a story in the Bible where people were asking Jesus a question like that. It was kind of a trick question. They were trying to trap him. But you guys did such a good job answering our questions. Do you think Jesus probably did a good job answering their questions too? Yeah, 
Yeah, he sure did. And Dr. J is going to tell all about that if you stay in church. And we're going to go to, those of you who are coming to Children's Church will hear about another question that Jesus asked and what his answer was. All right? So let's pray together before we go. Will you all help me pray? All right. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for Jesus. Who always asked good questions. Who always asked good questions. And always has the right answer. And always had the right answer. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, my little rowdies, let's go to Children's Church. No, God's children did say, Amen. Most of us have heard the expression that Jesus is the answer, and that's certainly true. Jesus is the answer to life's deepest longings and our deepest hurts. But you may or may not know that Jesus asked more than a hundred questions that are recorded in the Gospels. And this Back to School series, we're looking at seven of those questions that Jesus asked. We're looking at these questions as some of the most significant questions that he would have asked, and these are significant in how we understand them and how we would answer them ourselves. Today we continue with a scene where Jesus has entered into a synagogue, and he sees a man with a shriveled hand. 
which leads to a debate with the religious leaders that are gathered there in the synagogue. And it leads to a debate over the question, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? For those of you who are able, would you please stand and honor the reading of the gospel? Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 to 14. Jesus has just been teaching outside and making observations outside just prior to this reading. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Going on from that place, Jesus went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, If any of you has a sheep, and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand, so he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. Is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? Yes. Lee, if you'll come now, we want to do our hymn of discipleship. Stand as you're able. I mean, some of you got really excited about that point. I mean, really, uh, do we even have to discuss it? Is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? I mean, the quick, obvious answer is yes. Healing this man with a shriveled hand obviously is okay. I mean, this is a no-brainer of a question. How could there be any debate? Well, the reason there's debate is because when we think about how significant the Sabbath was then and now to our Jewish friends, we would understand that there would be a debate. The Sabbath, as you know, was not only commanded by God, it was part of the original Ten Commandments. It's recorded in Exodus 20, which Kate read for us. It's also recorded in Deuteronomy 5. And of all the Ten Commandments, the commandment about the Sabbath is the most elaborate of the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath, as you know, was observed and blessed by God at the very beginning of creation. The Sabbath had served for centuries, not as one of the distinctive marks, but it was the distinctive mark of the people of God. It is what separated them from the Gentiles. It is what set them apart as God's people in the world. It was a defining quality in their life that they would rest. No more were they in Egypt. No more did they answer to the crack of Pharaoh's whip 24-7, working and building bricks and laying bricks. They were free people. And as a symbol of their freedom, there was no other greater symbol than on the seventh day they rested as God rested. Sabbath keeping was not superficial or, or casual. In times of great distress, many faithful Israelites went to their death instead of breaking the Sabbath. To observant Jews then and now, the Sabbath was and is a joy. It's not a burden. The Sabbath is a day of festive rest from labor. It's a day of eating and drinking. You may know that on the Sabbath, it is forbidden to fast. You don't ever have to fast on the Sabbath. 
And from the very beginning, recorded in Deuteronomy, servants and slaves, they benefited from the Sabbath. They were not permitted to even work on the Sabbath. They joined in into the festivities. They were given the same food and the same drink on the Sabbath. You see, the Sabbath was the central, the central Jewish idea. It was the central part of the life of the Jew. Some years ago now, I had the good fortune to be able to go to the Holy Land, to go to Israel, and to stay in Jerusalem. And our hotel was in the new city, new part of Jerusalem, and they give you a free day on most of the tours. You will always have a free day. And guess what day is the free day? The free day is Saturday, the Sabbath. And why is the Sabbath the free day? Well, most of the guides, as you can imagine, are Jewish. We're Muslim. And the Sabbath is observed. And I remember the first time I was in Jerusalem on that Saturday, I was excited because you get to go to the old city or you get to walk wherever you want to do and the, the day is totally free to you. And so I got up early and I went downstairs outside the hotel and, and what had been a busy, bustling street all the other days that we were there. I mean, you would take your life in your own hands trying to step out from the sidewalk into the street. At that time of the day, there was absolutely no vehicles in the road. It was striking. I actually stepped out into the road and took a picture because of the silence. It was the Sabbath. We see this uh, in some respects in our own time. Here in Bowling Green this morning, I was driving in on 65 South. It was real foggy, but I could still see most of the vehicles. I passed three vehicles, or kept up with three. I don't know that. I passed one, <laughs> kept up with some others. But there were like three, how many vehicles tomorrow morning at 6.30 do you think will be on I-65 South headed to Nashville? I mean, even in our own community, we think that we should just pick on the Pharisees and the religious leaders here, but how many of us, how many of us grieve a little bit, just a little bit, that the Sabbath just seems to be just another day, just like any other day? Do my laundry, mow the yard, clean up my room, wash the car. I mean... It's easy to pick on these religious leaders. But I don't know about you, I kind of long for the day that maybe, even in our own day and time, we might capture or recapture some of the sanctity of the Sabbath. What we see as a no-brainer of a question was not in Jesus' day and really should not be in our day that easy a question to answer. Sabbath observance was very, very serious. And everybody, everybody knew the rules. And in fact, the religious leaders, it, it indicates that they are trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to trick him because everybody knew the rules of healing on the Sabbath. You could heal on the Sabbath if it was life-threatening. If it's not life-threatening, you're not permitted to heal on the Sabbath. And so this gentleman who's in the synagogue with the shriveled hand, it's a long-term condition. It's not life-threatening. And so they knew the right answer is, no, it is not lawful to heal this man on the Sabbath. But they had already gotten indications that Jesus was kind of loose with the Sabbath. His disciples just prior to this were picking grain on the Sabbath. And Jesus reminded them of King David in a time where David's men and he were hungry and they picked grain on the Sabbath. They didn't like that. But they knew, they understood that Jesus probably, probably would not answer the answer that everyone else would have given. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Everybody knew. If it's life-threatening, yes. If it's not life-threatening, no. And so Jesus responds. Jesus is a good rabbi. Jesus is so wise. He doesn't just answer their question. He responds with another question. And he says, 
If any of you have a sheep, and it means singular, it means you have one sheep, you're not very well off. If you have one sheep, and that sheep falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? And maybe you won't believe me, but I'm telling you the truth. There was a debate about that. Some said, absolutely not. You do not help an animal who's fallen into the pit. Some said you could give food to the animal to keep it alive until the Sabbath. Others said, look, it's okay if you lower some mats or some cushions. Just throw them down into the pit and the, and the animal can crawl out on its own. But there was this debate about whether or not it was just so out of hand. Now Jesus, he assumes, he assumes that they are going to rule in favor of common sense. If you have a sheep, it's the only sheep, it's your livelihood, who among you would not rescue it? And he expects them to rule in favor of common sense and not the letter of the law. And then there's the clincher. Then Jesus says to them, how much more, how much more valuable is a human being than a sheep? And there was silence. One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite teachers, I've told you about him before, was Dr. Ed Bevan. He was an Old Testament professor at Kentucky Wesleyan College. I loved that man. He taught me to love the Bible and to study the Bible and to wrestle with the Bible. And I, I had a prophet's class with Dr. Bevan. And in that prophet's class, Dr. Bevan would come into class and he would sit on the desk and cross his legs almost like a Buddha. And I've told you before, Dr. Bevan had hair like Albert Einstein, and he had the physique of Mahatma Gandhi, and he was just this frail, wise sage of a man. And in that prophet's class, I'll never forget the point he made, and I circled it, and I underlined it, and I have never forgot it. Dr. Bevan said, for the prophets, and he added, and for Jesus, who he saw in line with the prophets, for the prophets and Jesus, people, people were always more important than rules. People are more important than rules. Another way of saying that would be relationships with other human beings are more important than rules in the letter of the law. We had a good friend in a church I served in Owensboro, and this good friend of ours that was part of that church, when she was a youth, she uh, went to her home church not far from Owensboro, and she could play the piano. She could play then, she could play now. She was very gifted as a musician, and Michelle played uh, the piano one night in her home church, she shared with me. She said, I played the Sunday evening service because I didn't have anybody to play that night and so she could play and so she played the piano. And she said after the service, she said one of the saints, a lady came up to her after the service. As you can imagine, Michelle's 13, 14, she's anticipating this woman probably encouraging and saying, thank you so much for playing, you did so beautifully. Michelle said, the woman said to her, she said, if you should play in the service again, you do not need to wear pants. Ladies, if you're wearing pants, now would be the time to exit the sanctuary. I mean, really? How is it? How is it that tradition and ritual and rule. How is it that these things take on a life of their own and we completely forget what it is to relate human to human? Frederick Bickner said, Bickner said, principles. Principles are what people have instead of God. You'll see a lot of people in this world want to stand on principles and they're stomping on others to stand on their principles. 
principles are what people have instead of God. It's like the poet said. The poet said, ideologies do not bleed. They only blood the world. And we see it here. We see Jesus heal a man and because of the religious leaders' ideologies, because of their principles, because of their set in their ways, they can't see the miracle before them. They plot. It says they go out and they plot how they will kill him. Their principles are worth drawing blood. Their ideology is willing to take on casualties. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm kind of a rules guy. I like the rules. I like to know what the rules are. I'm not down on rules. And some of you are sitting there. You can't wait to get home. You're going to tell your mom and dad, Dr. J said the rules aren't important. Our relationship's important. <laughs> well, you're not going to get away with that because they're going to say, listen, our relation gets, gets better when you clean your room like I asked you to yesterday. So it's not, I'm not... We have to have rules. There's no question rules are important. I like the rules just like anybody else, and I like people to follow the rules. However, however, Jesus is suggesting that true religion is not about how many rules and regulations and principles and ideologies we can check off our list. True religion, according to Jesus, is about this ever-deepening relationship with God and with each other and with the rest of the world. That's true religion. Jesus is not down on the Sabbath and he's not down on rules and traditions. Jesus just understands that if our rules cause us to harm somebody else, if our principles cause us to want to humiliate somebody else, if our most heartfelt positions cause us to demonize somebody else, if our ideologies cause us to seek the destruction of somebody else, then friends, we need to seriously rethink the rules and the principles and the positions and the ideologies upon which our lives are founded. Is it okay? Is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? And the answer is, We could have sung the closing hymn, couldn't we, 20 minutes ago? The answer is yes. Not because rules don't matter, not because tradition doesn't matter, not because the Sabbath doesn't matter, but for Jesus, for Jesus there was never a bad day to do a good thing. There was never a bad day to heal and to restore and to save life. It's been so long ago now, I can't remember when I learned this song. I may have learned it at Lucon. I may have learned it at Bible school. I don't know. It's a simple song, and we're going to sing it together, but it's a simple and true song. People will not know that we love Christ, that we're part of his solution in the world by the rules we keep or the principles we adhere to or the ideologies, even the theological or biblical airtight arguments that we may possess. That's not how they will know that we are his. They know we are his by our love, by how we treat one another. Would you stand? Lee is at this time going to come and lead us in this hymn of discipleship. They'll know we are Christians by our love. I do invite you to stand and our closing hymn is in your white hymnal, number 429 in your white hymnal.
and sisters and brothers go from this place, enjoy the Sabbath. And should you come across someone who needs life, who needs healing, who needs something good done, uh, Jesus says, do it. And he says, do it not just on the Sabbath, but any day. Any day is a good day to do the right thing. To the glory of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.